wonderful things you have done for me. Amen. And there's the list goes on and on and on. Right. There's that old uh, hymnal song. Count your many blessings. Count them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God hath done. Amen. And when we begin to do that. Well, we can just begin to rack up all the times he was there for us, all the things he has done for us. Uh, uh, of course, the top of the list is giving his son to die for us, the salvation that we possess. And what we got the baptism in and of and with the Holy Spirit, the fire, the power, the love, the joy, the peace, everything that comes by the fruit of the spirit. And those are just the beginnings of a wonderful life in Christ. Amen. And so we do say, God, thank you for what you do. That amazing grace that you would bless us in such a manner. Amen. Truly the God that we serve is a wonderful God, the only God, the true and the living one. Amen. Praise God. Uh, so glad you're here with us tonight in worship, whether you're here in our building or whether you're joining us online. Uh, we just say welcome tonight uh, to our service and our worship to the Lord. We want to do remind you again, next Sunday is Father's Day. Next Sunday is Father's Day, and we do have gifts to be given, a time to get together. Next week they start Vacation Bible School uh, for all the young ones, uh, and we're going to have a good time in the house of the Lord uh, each Sunday as they're at the Spellers stellar space academy amen so share that share that with the others that you know that have children that they might come and be a part and uh, good things away remember again june 30th freedom sunday freedom sunday the barbecue the games the fun the families starting at 11 o'clock right here come in your patriotic garb and worship the lord together praise god uh, this time though we want to wait upon you for our sunday evening tithes and offerings we do appreciate those that are faithful in their support of the work of the Lord here. Uh, we know all Christians do pay tithes. Gladly given the offerings, want to be a part and uh, be obedient to God and therefore be blessed of God because that's how God said he would bless you in a the material type things is you give and I give back. He said, I, I can, you're never going to outgive me. So you just obey me and I'll take care of the rest. And it's a pleasure to know that we can do that in the Lord. Praise God. If I can get brother uh, Joey, and the brother Aguirre to come and assist us tonight in receiving the Sunday night tithes offering budget offering. You made a pledge to do that. We appreciate that and your faithfulness and support to that and supporting the work of the Lord. Praise God. And brother Aguirre, sir, would you please pray? Thank you for your giving tonight. God bless you for it. And at this time, Reverend Redding is going to come and going to minister to us that which the Lord hath laid upon his heart for you tonight. Because God knew you'd be here. I didn't necessarily know who would come and who wasn't. Reverend didn't know, but God knew. And so he's prepared this message specifically for each one of us that are here. Amen. Tonight. God bless you, Reverend. God. It's always a privilege and an opportunity, a great opportunity to be in the house of the Lord and thankful for the, the opportunity to be able to minister the word of God tonight. As the Lord dealt with my heart about this message, I'm sure sometime last week, I can't remember exactly when, it seemed good to the Lord to be able to preach tonight concerning this. I'm going to be in the book of Isaiah chapter 61 tonight, Isaiah chapter 61, and I'm going to read just three verses, and this is something also that can be found in the book of Luke chapter 4 verse 18, where Jesus himself was talking about this as the scriptures are, were basically being fulfilled in him, but Isaiah chapter 61, looking at verse 1, 
where the Bible declares, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And I'm going to use verse 3 for my text tonight. And with the help of the good Lord, we're going to preach on this thought or title of a message, The Garment of Praise. The Garment of Praise of praise. Pastor, can you please pray, sir? Amen. The garment of praise. Without fear or contradiction, it is safe to say that it is not God's will for humanity to live in sadness. We all go through trials, hardships, unforeseen circumstances, or battles. And one of the challenges that we all must face eventually, one day, is dealing with losing someone that we love. The loss of a loved one is tough, and it is not something that you immediately get over. The healing process takes time, and everyone is affected a little differently, but we don't have to go through difficult moments alone. The Bible declares in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, in what is commonly referred to as the Beatitudes, Jesus speaking during his Sermon on the Mount, he says, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You see, in ancient times, it was customary for a grieving person to wear a sackcloth made of black goat's hair. It was coarse, it was rough, and it was thick. The sackcloth and ashes were used as an outward sign of one's inward condition. And such a symbol made one's heart or made one's change of heart visible and demonstrated the sincerity of one's grief and or repentance. You see, in America and different parts of the world, It is very common for people at a funeral to wear dark and solemn clothing as a sign of mourning. The dark clothing worn by people assembled together is a sure indication that someone has died. And when we face those tough moments, it can leave an empty space where a part of us feel as though something has died. Our heart is hurting, however it may be. But in the midst of all of it, God makes up the difference. He takes what is broken and he fixes it. He can restore, replenish, rejuvenate, revive, and redeem whosoever will. God will take what is wrong and exchange it for something better. You see, many times, you may hear different ones in the world, of course, those who are God-haters or people who don't believe, you know, they have these different ideas and concepts concerning how Christians are, and, it, you know, you just say things like we're weak-minded or whatever the situation is. But, you know, it's, it really has nothing to do with being weak-minded. I would say it has everything to do with being strong-minded. Someone that made it up in their mind, you know, I'm going to serve God. I know things may be tough around me going on, but I'm still going to put my uh, faith in God. I'm going to put my trust in God. And I'd rather go through it uh, with God than to go on by myself. Or I'd rather do it with God than to try to fill the void in my life and, and doing something that I'll live to regret later on. Uh, but when we come to the Lord and we just acknowledge, you know, God, I have a need in my life and, and there are some broken uh, things in my life. But God, I'm going to put my hand in your hand and I'm going to come, just continue to trust in you, Lord. I'm going to allow you, Lord, to lead me and guide me so that my life can be blessed. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to trust in my Lord. I'm going to see God work. I was thinking about the message that was, uh, that was preached this morning. And, and, you know, it really blessed my soul. I would say that many people were blessed by it. Not that any other message don't bless your soul. But every message just hits you a little bit differently. 
Because God knows the need of the hour. And that's how our God is. He's a very personal God. And he's a, he, he knows everything about us. So someone may be going through something and maybe similar to what you're going through, but we know we never discuss it amongst ourselves. Uh, but it's something about being in a, in a, in a service, and, and you allow the Holy Spirit to just move in your life and say, God, I'm ready to receive. Uh, I'm ready for you to meet the need, God. I want to see you do it again in my life. Uh, I want to see you do something great. Uh, God, I'm still believing in almighty you right now. I'm trusting in you, my God. But I want to look at the office of Christ. As I read to you from the book of Isaiah chapter 61, here, in, um, and this was prophecy that was going to be fulfilled. And I was looking at the scripture earlier and just always like to do a little comparison because in in the book of uh, Luke, now he shares it just a little bit differently, but still dealing with uh, the the same thing. And that is how he says that the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And God is doing something, I would say, even even now in the hearts and lives of men and women, as he's dealing with our hearts, and he wants us to climb a little bit higher. And, and you know, it's not God's will for us to just uh, be by the wayside, and just, he doesn't care about us, and we just know we're going through something, he's right there with us. But in the book of Luke chapter 4, he said it this way, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. The gospel, or uh, here he says good tidings, same thing, the good news. He says to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. But we look here at the office of Christ, and his name does mean anointed. So when he says that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, He has anointed me, or in other words, he has put me into this position to where he has consecrated me, and he has furnished me with the necessary powers for the administration. I mean, he's God. He can do whatever he wants. He can do whatever he wants, and he meets the, he doesn't just meet us halfway. He doesn't just meet, just do a a work in our lives, just a small portion, but no, God, he gets right down to the very core of whatever's going on in our lives. He gets right down to the very nitty-gritty, and he names specifically uh, things that are going on in our lives, and he knows exactly how to fix it. And thank God for counselors and therapists that are out there right now, and and they do help in in some way, I'm sure. But, you know, it's something about Almighty God when he gets a hold of us. It's something about how God goes on the inside because he can do what the therapist cannot do. He can do what the counselors cannot do. He knows how to get, uh, not to just the surface parts, but he goes back beneath the surface, and he knows how to get to the very core of our existence, and he knows how to meet the very need. He says, I'm going to do it in your life. God says, I have some glad tidings for you. I have some some good news. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 25, he says, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. You ever get to a place where you're just tired of hearing about bad news? There's never a shortage of bad news in the world. But it's something about when you hear something good. Man, this person, maybe they were, they, they rescued someone from a burning car. You do find some stories in the news like that. And it's like, wow, how refreshing. Something that, you know, it, it, the, the news, it wasn't distorted. There was no sort of a, a, another twist to it. No, a person was in the car. It was on fire. And they were, by the grace of God, they were extracted from the car. And that's good news. But how much more is it good news when we hear about what Christ has done for so many people? How much more good news is when you experience the love of God for yourself and you see a move in your life and you have a testimony and no one can take it away from you? The enemy will lie. He'll say all kinds of things. But I know what God has done for me and my life. Uh, That's good news. Uh, The Lord is still able to save a man or a woman. The Lord is still able to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost. Uh, The Lord is still able to do miracles uh, uh, tonight. We may not be aware of every single miracle, but we have to believe that our God is still working miracles. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He says, For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. As Christians, what do we have to be ashamed of? He says, If you be ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. 
I don't want my God to be ashamed of me. He says, but it is the power of God unto salvation. What is the good news? What is the gospel? What are the glad tidings? The book of Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. He says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's the gospel right there. Man, when I was out there in the world confused, doing my own thing, and you can fill in the blank however God found you, uh, whether you were on drugs, sleeping around, whatever, no stones to throw. He said he did say, and such were some of you. But wherever he found us and we come to that place where we hit rock bottom, or maybe it wasn't even rock bottom, but we just realized, man, there has to be more to life than what I'm doing right now. There has to be more to life than just going through the motions, uh, working a job nine to five. I come home, I'm too tired really to do anything else. Uh, there has to be more to life. Yes, there is more to life. And his name is Jesus. He can still help a man. He can still save a man. He can still do great things uh, in our midst tonight. He says, he hath anointed me to heal the brokenhearted. This is what my God can do. To heal the brokenhearted. Now here in, a, in Isaiah 61, he says, to bind up the brokenhearted. So he's talking about the same thing. To cure literally or figuratively. To free from errors and sins. Or, as he says, bind, to wrap firmly. You know, if you want to stop the bleeding, you get cut. And you got to, you know, a Band-Aid may help to a great degree, but a lot, if depending on the severity of the, the cut, you have to wrap it real tight to stop the bleeding. And God knows how to heal a man or a woman whose heart is uh, figuratively bleeding. He knows how to wrap it up. He doesn't just put a little uh, Band-Aid on it, so to speak. No, he knows how to heal it completely. I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to do something great for this person. This person who acknowledged uh, that they have a need. Uh, I'm going to do a great work uh, in this person's life. The psalmist declared in Psalm 34, he says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save it such as be of a contrite spirit. Or in other words, that person is just so, that word contrite means broken or just like to so many pieces to where it's like a fine dust. The enemy knows how to break some people down. But my God knows how to fix those people. He went on to say, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Let's see, <laughs> Christians go through things too, you know. He says, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all, no matter what the affliction is. The enemy says, I got you. You're a failure. You're a loser. There's no way you're going to make it this time. Uh, don't go back to that church. Uh, don't talk to the pastor. You better not take down the pastor's phone number. Because he don't want us to get the help that we need. He don't want us to talk to, to the brethren. He wants us to be isolated. He wants to, us to just be alone and off to ourselves uh, while we're looking to self-help books that really don't help. He wants to do all those things, get us all mixed up in the mind. But my Bible tells us that the Lord delivereth him out of them all, out of every affliction. Whatever it is, it may be the pain that's racking your body. God can deliver you. There may be some mental torment where you're feeling so anxious and overwhelmed. God knows how to fix that also. It doesn't matter what the problem is. It could be something as simple as I hit my big toe on the way to the restroom in the middle of the night. God knows how to fix your big toe. Ten, you don't even have to call a tow truck. Sorry, bad joke. I know. Stick to your job as a preacher. Okay, here we go. He went on to say that he, now remember this, this unction, this God, the spirit of the Lord is so amazing in so many different ways. But he says that, the, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And he, and he mentioned something else. I mean, there was a few things that he mentioned here. We're moving on to how he preaches deliverance to the captives. You see, serving God is not just, oh, I don't have anything else to do. Oh, I'm just going to go to church because there, there they go. Those church folks always coming by. They're going to send me a text. They're going to knock on my door. No, it's more to it than that. I choose to serve the Lord, first of all, because I love him. And I love him because he first loved me. 
My life was a mess. And I would say before any of us get saved, we are in a spiritual prison. Our mind is just, just all over the place, doing whatever it is that's convenient for us and feels good to the flesh. But the Lord knows how to deliver every person that's in captivity. And so my mind went back to the man by the name of Legion, who can be found in the Gospels. This man who was a demoniac, this man who was not in his right mind. I remember doing a study on him one time, and, and I was just doing a comparison to what the world or how they would categorize him. The world would categorize him as someone who is schizophrenic. I mean, he meets all those definitions according to uh, a diagnostics uh, manual. It shows how people mind is all whatever, whatever. But in the world, they would say he's schizophrenic. Now, we read about this man. It was more to it than that. I mean, he had a spiritual condition. His, his, his mind was so messed up. He had many demons or devils inside of him. And the Bible talks about how he saw the Lord from afar off. And he came for whatever small window it was. There must have been something that was right just for that small moment to where he saw the Lord afar off and he ran to him. I'm glad I don't have to wait till I have to be like Legion to run to the Lord. Legion was cutting himself with rocks. The Bible talks about how they tried to bind him with chains and fetters, but he could not be bound. He would just break them. Maybe he would even laugh in their face as they were trying to bind him up. Uh, I don't know. The man was not in his right mind. He was naked. He would run around the tombs, uh, scratch himself with rocks or cut himself with rocks. Uh, he was a person that was considered a lunatic. And in the midst of all of his issues and his problems, he saw the Lord from afar off, and he ran to him. And the Lord was asking him, what shall I do for you, or how should I help you in so many words? And of course, he would even ask the man um, what his name is. And the man said, my name is Legion, for we are many. But it didn't take a very long time for this man by the name of Legion to be delivered. It didn't take him forever to, to finally be, be set free. The Lord saw him and he told that unclean spirit to come out of him. And now the devil is pleading with him, oh, well, please uh, send us over into the pigs. Send us over there. Uh, and then the Lord says, okay, sure, if that's the way you want it, I'll send you over into the pigs. But Legion was delivered. He was, in his mind, he was, he was being held captured, uh, uh, captive by Satan himself. But isn't our God still a, a healer tonight to where he can preach deliverance to those who are held captive? No, they may not, their situation might not be as dark as Legion, but God is still able to preach deliverance. Why? Because there is still power in the name of Jesus. To even when the devil has to obey, the devil could not do anything about it. When the Lord said, let him go or, or come out of him, he had to obey almighty God. And when we come to the Lord with our needs, Legion could have just stayed in the tombs doing just doing what he continued to do. But he knew he had a need in his life and something wasn't right and he ran to the Lord. And when it was all said and done, the Lord healed him and the man was clothed and in his right mind. When God gets a hold of you, he does a whole complete job. There is no things that are left undone. No, when the Lord comes on the scene, he comes to take over. I'm going to help them. I'm going to give them this, uh, this deliverance that they've been looking for, recovering sight to the blind. We read about Bartimaeus. We read about the man that was born blind. Both of these men, no doubt, didn't know each other, but they both got their healing by the same one, the same God. The same God that was able to heal them back then is the same God that's able to heal us right now. Remember, prophecy was being fulfilled. And God is still able to do it. These men didn't have their sight. Bartimaeus, he heard about the Lord coming by and began to cry out, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the people that told him to be quiet, shut up, hold your peace. And evidently, uh, the Bible didn't say this. I don't think the man was hard of hearing, but what if he was? <laughs> okay, he told me to shut up. Okay, that kind of sounded like what he said, shut up. He just cried out a little bit more louder. Jesus, 
Thou son of David, have mercy on me. When you got a need in your life, you're going to get loud. When you have a need in your life, you're going to be excited. When you have a need in your life, man, you don't have time for the fault finders and the haters and the naysayers. I don't care what you got to say. My God can heal me. My God can do it. Uh, there's a need in my life, uh, and I'm coming to my God to get my healing. I'm going to get my blessing. I want God to help me in my time of need. He said, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. In verse 2, he went on to say, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil for joy, or the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. And that gets me to this point here, talking about divine exchange. God says, all those who are mourning, I'm going to comfort them. I'm going to take away those nasty ashes, which resemble or which is a real sign of mourning and hurting, and I'm going to give them beauty. I'm going to give them some oil of joy for mourning. The psalmist declared in Psalm 30, verse 11, he says, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. You know, when God gets a hold of you, you want to rejoice. When God gets a hold of you, you're going to be glad. And I recognize, man, you know, you lose someone, it, it might not, you might not feel like rejoicing right away. Oh, but just give God, just, just give it a little bit of time. And God will definitely move on your behalf. He says, I'm going to give this, this people, or these people, the garment of praise for their spirit of heaviness. And that's exactly what it is. It's a spirit of heaviness when someone loses someone. I remember when I got to my unit years ago when I was in the Army, and uh, this was the first memorial service that I went to for a soldier that passed. And he was the first um, casualty of the Afghanistan war. Nate Chapman, I'll never forget it. And of course, many things were done for him. They named a, a street after him. Um, and because during that time, especially in America, 9-11 was still pretty fresh, and there were still people who were, you know, hurt by that and feeling very patriotic. And so this was in the city of Tacoma. I mean, this was a big deal. The fire department were out there on the bridge. They had their, their ladders up, and they had a, um, a flag draping down. The Chinooks had flew over the unit. I mean, it was, it was a big deal, but it was so sad. And I remember one of the things that really, you know, something about seeing those kids um, and, and just knowing that, you know, their, their dad is gone. The little boy, he must have been maybe about three years old or so, and he had on a dress uniform. And it's like, he, I don't know if there was a dry eye in that place. And it's that spirit of heaviness is, is just there. And you know, what do you tell a person when they just lose someone? Like, oh, it's going to be all right. Maybe it will, but just not right now. And God knows all about it. There's a type of grief I learned about some time ago. And they call it complicated grief or complicated grief disorder, prolonged grief disorder, traumatic grief, persistent complex bereavement disorder. But basically, it's a mental disorder that can occur after the death of a loved one. It's characterized by prolonged and intense grief that can significantly impact a person's health, work, and social life. And some of the symptoms include thinking about the circumstances or consequences of the death or what could have been done differently. Numbness or detachment, bitterness, or feeling like you no longer have purpose. The Lord had to have foreseen all of this, to know that people can be so destroyed by losing someone. And God says, you know what? I have the remedy for you. I have something I, I'm willing to, to give. I'm willing to exchange. I'm willing to take all of your hurt I'm willing to take all of your pain. I'm willing to take all of the worry and the crying and the stress. And, and I'm willing to give you something else. I'm willing to give you something that the world cannot offer you. I'm willing to give you some joy. I'm, I'm willing to give you some hope. I'm willing to give you some peace. I'm willing to give you some love. How about this? I'm willing to give you my own, my very own son, Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what you've been going through. I'm here to heal the brokenness. I can do it for you. In John chapter 16, verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you of the truth. It is expedient for you 
that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Comforter, of course, talking about the Holy Spirit, coming from the Greek word parakletos, means advocate, consoler, call to one side or aid, an intercessor. That's what our God does for us. He intercedes. He gets on the inside. And he just, it's not just a little cover-up. No, he, he gets to the inside. And he can make it better. In the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 11, it says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. I'm glad that God, he can fix the problem. And we don't have to turn to the, the, to the bagley elements of this world, the things that just don't satisfy, the things that will still leave you broken, the things that still have, will leave you with a huge void, and in some cases just probably make you worse. Oh, but when a man or a woman comes to the Lord, God, I'm, I'm broke. God, I'm hurt. God, I'm stressed out. God, I, I just got to surrender it all to you, Lord. I have to lay it at your feet because every time I try to fix this things, uh, these things on my own, it just doesn't work. Every time I try to put my hands on a situation, it just gets worse. Uh, oh, but God, if you can have mercy on me uh, one more time. Oh, God, if you can just fill the void in my life. Uh, oh, God, if you can touch me uh, one more time, uh, I know that it's going to be all right. I just have to trust in you, God. I know it's going to work. I know it's going to be all right. He says the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. The trees of righteousness. What does a tree do or how does, it, how does this relate to us? When God gets a hold of you, you can be solid. You can be firm. You can be rooted. You can bring forth fruit. And ultimately, God will get all the glory. When a person says, well, I remember so-and-so was just really messed up. He, 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 was, he hit a rough patch in life, and, and now all of a sudden it seems like he's a, he's a different person. Let me tell you what happened. I went to the Lord. I, my, my life was broken, and it was going, it was going nowhere. But I, 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 all I knew how to do was just get to the Lord. All I knew how to do was just call upon God. All I knew how to do was just uh, trust in God because the things that I was doing, it, they, they were never working. I, in fact, I just found myself uh, getting to a deeper and deeper, darker place. Uh, but it wasn't until when I looked up onto the hills uh, from whence my help come from. And I realized that, oh, God, I know you're up there. God, I know you're listening. God, I know a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise it. And here it is, oh, Lord. I want you to move in my life uh, once again. God, I want you to fix the problem. Fix the problem in my life. They can make their way to the instruments as we prepare to close. The garment of praise. You know, when the person is going through, many times you can see it. You can see it in their face. You can see it in their whatever. You might notice some certain, certain changes in their life. Like, how did they get to this point or how did they get to that place well, they're going through something. It should be a, a sign that, you know, I, I need to pray for them. I want to say a prayer for them. You, you pray for them right then because otherwise you put it off, you might forget about it. But then there may be those times where you start to notice, oh, wow, something has changed. Something is different. They have on a different garment today. I remember what they were like before, but the garment is different. And some may say, well, that's judgmental, but I think we all do it, and it's pretty normal. We don't, not judging in the sense that we have a hell or a heaven to put someone in, but just being able to distinguish from what's what. Can I get a witness tonight? You see a police officer, how do you know he's a police officer? He has a badge, he has a gun, his, in fact, he has on a hat that says police. You see a fireman, he have on some big old bulky boots and a big old coat, uh, fireman. But the garment of praise, what is it? is it? Is it a nice suit of clothing? Not necessarily. But I would say someone that's happy and someone that's rejoicing, more than likely they're going to wear something that goes with that mood. Someone who's just lost someone, they may wear dark clothing because they're in the morning. But God says, I'm going to take all that away, and I'm going to give you something better. I'm going to take it all away, all the hurt, all the pain, and I'm going to exchange it for something better. The sorrow that you're going through, I'm going to take it away. The pain that you're going through, I'm going to take it away. I'm going to give you some joy, some real refreshing 
joy like never before. What about it tonight with heads bowed and eyes closed? In reverence to Almighty God, the garment of praise. No matter how deep the pain is that we may be going through sometimes, God always has something better. God, I thank you for the message, Lord, that you laid on my heart. God, how I felt you dealt with me accordingly, according to your word. And God, right now, my prayer is that you would just continue to have your way in the rest of this service, oh God. Bless those who are able to listen online, those who are here right now. God, help us to apply your word to our heart and to our lives. And God, to just remember that you are ultimately the one that's in control. God, remember that you are the one that have it all figured out. And we pray that you would continue to help us in all things and comfort us. Just comfort us no matter what's going on. God, help us to feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, God, even now in Jesus' name. The altar is open. Let's all find a place to pray and just talk to the Lord for a little bit. God is here.